Amen. So we're going we're gonna to go into Ephesians chapter uh, 2 again as we're continuing our study through Ephesians. Again, this is more of a teaching than preaching per se, but in Ephesians chapter 2, last week we looked at the first um, 10 verses and in there, verses 9 and 10 especially, it talks about you are saved by faith, not of works lest anyone should boast, and even that it is a gift of God. And so uh, Paul really gets this idea across that it's not of our works, and he's talking, remember, to, to uh, a Gentile and a Jewish mix. We read about this in Acts chapter 19 when Paul went into Ephesus. A lot of the Jews came out, but then they started turning against him, so he turned to the Gentiles, and tremendous revival in the entire city. And he's saying, listen, we're not saved by our works. I remember years ago as a kid, um, we, we were going through this haunted house, and they had all of these statues of monsters and vampires and werewolves, and there was a devil, you know, with the red, red uniform and the horns and the, the pointy tail and the pitchfork, and we're going by, and there's strobe lights, and there's cobwebs, and we go by, and we walk past this devil, and we no sooner, and I was in the back, I was trailing, we no sooner got past them, and he jumped off of his little platform. See, all the rest of them were just like, you know, wax figures he jumped out and he said have you been good and uh well i'll tell you what man i had an out-of-body experience right then and there i think i soiled myself a little bit you know i i I felt like taking that pitchfork and jamming it up his nose and saying yeah i'll show you good you know but i was thinking about that and i thought of how how that is really the world system and that's religion it's based on behavior where Christianity is based on belief. And when we get our beliefs right, our behaviors follow our beliefs. But our beliefs don't necessarily follow our behaviors. And so this is what Paul's talking about. He's not ta- he says it's not about works. It's not about behavior. It's about faith. It's about believing in Jesus Christ and coming to him. And, um, and so as we start out in verse 11... He says, therefore, and you know whenever you see a therefore, you have to find out what it's there for. And so he says, therefore, on the basis of the fact that for thousands and thousands of years, the Jews have had it instilled in them that they were to be a separate people right? Be separate. Be holy. Don't mix yourselves with the nations of the land that I'm bringing you in. Uh, Be separated unto the Lord. And so for thousands of years, they had in this be orthodox, be pure, be separate. And so they had built up all of these things that caused them to be a separate people. And now Paul is trying to get into that worldview and break it apart a little bit. Because on the basis of faith, God is doing a new thing. Therefore, he says, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, that would be us unless you're Jewish, who are called uncircumcision by those who are called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. And so he starts talking about barriers. Now, the Jews had built a lot of barriers around them just because God wanted them to be separate from the world. But there's so many barriers that we build up in life. We build up gender barriers. We build up social barriers. We build up ethnic or racial barriers. We build up age barriers. Uh, We build up economic barriers. We build up IQ or intelligence barriers. And what Paul is trying to get at is there is now no division in Christ. As a matter of fact, Paul said this in Galatians chapter 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free man nor male nor female. You are all one in Jesus Christ. And he talked about this being done by a circumcision, not in the flesh, but a circumcision in the heart. God has done something in our heart. God has done a new work in our heart, and we've been born again. He continues in verse 12, and he says, remember. This is the second time now. He's saying, remember, remember. He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. 
Now, even though he's talking to a very religious people, he's talking to a very pagan people that had all of the Greek gods and all of the Roman gods, and he says, you were really without God. Even though you had all of these idols and all these false gods, he said, you had no hope, you were without God, you didn't have Christ, you were, at that time, separated from Christ. Now, when he uses this word Christ, in the Greek it's the word Christos, and it means the anointed one. And we know that in the Old Testament, the anointing of the Spirit came upon prophets, came upon priests, came upon kings for them to do what God wanted them to do. But Jesus, as the Christos, Jesus actually in the Hebrew, it's the word Messiah, the anointed one, the one that has the Spirit. John said, I beheld the Spirit come upon him and not leave. In, in John's Gospel, it says that Jesus had the Spirit without measure. And so he is the Messiah. But the Gentiles had no hope of a coming Messiah. The Gentiles had no hope of a coming Savior or a coming Deliverer. But the Jews had this hope that one day Messiah was coming. The Anointed One of God was coming, and he was going to set everything right. He was going to make everything good. He was going to bring Israel back up into its zenith heyday of power, a world-ruling nation, and all of these things. And so they had this optimism. They always had this outlook that the Gentiles did not have. And because of that, they were holy people. Now, the word holy is the word hagos, and hagos comes from two words, ho and laos. Ho meaning separated, and laos meaning the people. And so they were separated people. Again, there's this whole thing about separation, and they were different. That was the separation meant they were different from everybody else in the world. And so they had a future in God that the Gentiles didn't have. One of the things that they had was that God was to be their king. In Judges 8, verse 23, Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my sons rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So we know that Israel was a theocracy. Um, uh, they had God as their ruler, God as their king that ruled over them, and, and, and they understood that. They understood that God was the king. The psalmist said in Psalms 145, 1, I will extol you, my God, O king. And so they understood that God's rule was over their life. I will bless your name forever and ever. And so they had the presence of God. They had the covenants of God. Um, they had the delivering of God, Exodus 6, 7. Then I will take for you my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And so they had this special plan that they knew God was using them alone. And, um, but we need to understand that Abraham, who's the father of the Jewish people, was born a Gentile, right? There wasn't any Jews or any Israelites. And Abraham didn't become the father of the Jewish people by circumcision or because of these covenants. He became the father because of his faith. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness, the Bible says. And so by faith, he becomes the father of the uh, Jewish people. Now, they had these covenants given to them. And um, most of these covenants are spiritual in nature, and they have what's called double reference. That yes, it speaks to the nation of Israel, but it also speaks to what God is doing in the earth, bringing in salvation through the anointed one, through his Christ. And so here's just a couple of the covenants. So the first one was the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, God said, Abraham, in you and in your seed, in your descendant, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Now, we know that that refers more to than just Isaac, his son, that he received by promise. Because Paul in Galatians talks about how Christ is Abraham's seed, and in Christ, not in Israel, but in Christ, all the nations are blessed because now all the nations can receive the saving power and the forgiveness of sin through what Jesus Christ did. Another one was the covenant of the land that they were to possess. We know that Solomon uh, unified the land in his reign, but this is also typifying the millennial reign, which is to come, a 1,000-year reign, where Christ will rule on this earth, and the Bible says you and I will rule with him in that time. And that land will become a very specific, very specialized land. It's God's land. He gave it to his people. And I don't think a week goes by where Israel is not in the news one way or another because there's so much faction and there's so much debate about this land 
uh, you know, the Palestinians say it's theirs, the Jews say it's theirs, and there's all kinds of crazy things going on. There was the Davidic covenant, and that was that a descendant of David would always sit on the throne of Israel. Now, we know that that, again, is talking about Christ, that he is the root and the offspring of David, and that he is on the throne forever. And then, of course, there was the new covenant where God said, I'll take out that heart of stone, I'll put in you a heart of flesh that will be sensitive and tender and in relationship with me, and by your belief, your behavior will change. And so, again, talking about being in Christ. Now, Paul goes on in Galatians 3, verse 29, and he says this if you belong to christ now that's talking about you and i if you belong to christ then you are abraham's descendant heirs according to the promise so we may not be abraham's descendants by lineage by um heredity but we are by faith his descendants because he's the father of faith and the father of the jewish people so we are his descendants by faith we are part of all of these covenants in Christ. We are in Christ. We're Abraham's descendant. And he says, heirs according to all the promises of God. Now, Paul is, is trying to do something really big because he's got this huge factions between the Jews and the Gentiles that he is attempting now to uh, bring healing to. In verse 13, he says this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near by the blood of christ so he's saying listen there was a separation and the jews themselves were separated because of their sin and uh, but god has brought them near i love the scripture here in job chapter 9 verses 2 and 3 he says in truth i know that this is so how can a man be right before god if one wishes to dispute him he could not answer him once in a thousand times he goes on to say in Job chapter 9, verse 32, For he is not a man that I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together. There is no empire between us that may lay his hands on us. So a mediator is going to put his arm around this one and his arm around this one and say, Hey, look it. We're a team. We're together. And Job is saying there's no one that's going to do this be between us and God. But the Bible says that there's one mediator between God, and that is the man Jesus Christ, that he has come and grabbed the Jew and grabbed God and said, listen, by my sacrifice, I have fulfilled all of the covenants of Judaism. And then Jesus goes and grabs his arms around the Gentiles, you and I, the, the, the pagans, and around God. And he says, by my blood, through the blood of the cross, you're brought together. Then he wraps his arm around the Jew and the Gentile, and he says, guess what? You're already in relationship with God through me, and that makes you one big family. And it's something new that I have done through my blood. And so he's talking about a separation, and a separation calls for a mediator. There's a, a rabbinical saying that when someone was converted to Judaism, it was called being brought near. They have been brought near to God. And uh, there was a story of Rabbi Eliezer who was approached by a sinful woman and she asked him to be brought near. She wanted to become a God-fearer, a proselyte to Judaism, and he slammed the door in her face. The good thing is, is that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the door is opened. Jesus said, I will in no ways reject anyone. He says, I will not... Uh, cast out anyone who comes to me we're all going to be welcomed and received and so he goes on to say now in verse 14 for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall in verse 14 and so the temple we know had all kinds of barriers right it had the court of the gentiles it had the court of the women it had the court of the israelite men it had the court of the priests and then of course it had the holy of holy place uh, where only the priests could go in once uh, in a while and this is what paul was accused of in acts chapter 21 the jews said that he brought timothy who was a greek into the court of the israelites and they started a whole riot over the whole thing, and Paul needed to be rescued, and that's how he ended up going to Rome. But we know that at the death of Christ, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies with the rest of the temple was torn from top to bottom, and that was a honk, and some scholars say it was four inches thick, and it was torn, signifying that the presence of God is no longer 
behind walls. There's no barriers in the presence of God that we all have an approach to be able to come before God and there's no more prejudice. You know, men build walls. In New, here we are New Englanders, right? Everywhere you go, there's rock walls. They're very beautiful. They're very picturesque. I mean, we had rocks. I had to do something with them, you know, so we built walls. This is mine and that's yearn. And you stay over there and, you know, I'll stay over here. And so we got all these barriers. And it's, it seems like it's the job of people through their prejudice and fears to build barriers. And it's the job of missionaries to cross barriers. Missionaries build bridges where people build walls. Missionaries build bridges and they go in and they talk about the love of Christ. And he says here that he has become our peace in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. You're at peace with God this morning. I hope you know that. God is at peace with you, and you should be at peace with God. We're at peace together this morning. He goes on in Romans chapter 8, 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, rhetorical question, the answer is no. In other words, there are no more separations. There's no more separations of customs and, and, and ordinances and laws. Only the love of Christ now overrides all things. He goes on in verse 15, Ephesians 2, 15, and he says, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so that he himself might make the two into one new man, thus, again, establishing peace. So we know that the commandments of God, uh, he talks about, were contrived in ordinances that dealt with hygiene, dealt with feasts, dealt with Sabbath, dealt with fasts, dealt with all kinds of things, and yet Jesus ended all of that legalism and replaced it with simply love for God. We talk about the irreducible core of Christianity that is found in the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. The Great Commandment is that you shall love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And the Great Commission is to go into all the world and make disciples. I mean, that's basically it. That is Christianity 101. You can't make it any littler than that. That is a simple, and this is what he's talking about. And Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17, don't think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but fulfill. He didn't do away with them. He fulfilled them. You see, manhood doesn't destroy childhood. It simply fulfills it. You know, Paul said, when I was a kid, I thought as a kid, now I'm an adult, I think differently, but I didn't destroy childhood, I just fulfilled it. I just, I, I, I became what it was causing me to become. And so Jesus said, I have done what the law was requiring of God's justice and God's holiness. I've completed it, I've fulfilled it, and now you have newness in me. And he says here that he's brought these two together and made a new man. He's taken the Jew and he's taken the Gentile and he's made a new man. And it's really interesting because in the Greek he uses a very specific word. There's a word in the Greek called neos. Neos means something that's new because it's made from a copy. All right, you make a prototype and then off the prototype you make copies. But then there's another word called kaneos and kaneos means something new that never existed before. And this is the new that Paul is using. He's saying he makes a new man. He makes a new entity. And that is basically the church. It's something new that God has done. It would be like if you took a statue of silver and a statue of lead and melted them down and came up with a statue of gold. It's something new. It's something completely different. It didn't come from the other two. It's something new that God's done. And he's saying, listen, God has taken everything he's done with the Jew and he's taken the rest of the world, and he's melted them down, and he's come up with something new, and that's redeemed people by the blood of Jesus Christ that comprise this thing called the family of God, or the church, or the coming kingdom of God. People from every tongue and tribe and dialect and language and ethnicity that he has caused to become new creatures in Christ. And it's not by religious works, it's simply by faith that what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, he did for you personally, and he fulfilled everything that God wanted him to fulfill. And then Paul goes on into verse 16, and he says, and he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having put to death the enmity. And so he absorbed in his flesh 
everything. He absorbed Israel's inability in sinful flesh to keep the law. He absorbed the pagan uh, inability to go the wrong way and not even know that there was a God. And, and worshiping that which wasn't God. He absorbed it and killed the enmity. And he's bringing peace. He's bringing something new. Ephesians 17 and 18, he says, And he came and he preached peace to you who are far, peace to you who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. And so Jesus comes to those who thought they were near God, to the Jews. We are in relationship with God through our covenants, and to those that were so far outside it wasn't even funny. And he preaches peace to both of them, brings them together, and through one Spirit we both have access, we have access in him through the Spirit to the Father. And I just, I love that little verse right there because it's another Trinitarian verse. You know, nowhere in the Bible do you find the word the Trinity. And yet we are Trinitarians because of verses like this all over the Scriptures where we find the Son in Him. We have access through the Spirit to the Father. So you have Son, Spirit, Father. Father, Spirit, Son. And so this is another Trinitarian verse that talks to us about one God in three persons. And he's saying in this work of God, again, remember it's all in Him. The theme of Ephesians is in Him. In Him we fulfill the law of Moses. In Him we've been redeemed. In Him we become a new creation, the church. And all of these things are happening because of Christ. But he says through the Spirit, through Christ, through the Spirit, we have access to the Father. You have access this morning to the Father. And you know, I, I, James says you have not because you ask not. I, I, you know, this verse right here in Hebrews chapter 4, therefore let us draw near. This is the whole thing, you know. The, the, the Gentiles wanted to be brought near. When someone was converted, they were called being brought near. And, and he says, let us draw near. We all have the right through the Spirit by Christ to come boldly. Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Man, heaven's doors have been opened wide for you and for me. Let's jump at the opportunity. This is why prayer is so important. He's talking about coming to God in prayer, bringing your needs before God. Ask of me, he says, and I will show you great and mighty things. Jesus said, whatsoever things you ask in my name, the Father will do it. And so he's giving us this invitation to come before him. Even as we did this morning when we were worshiping him, we were coming before him intentionally. We were pursuing. The Bible says, as the deer longs for the water, so my soul longs after God. And so we hunger and we thirst and we draw near. We come close to God. And when we do, the Bible says, as you draw near to him, he draws near to you. And he begins to pour out in your hearts and in your life. You know, we're friends of God because of what God has done. Verses 19 and 20, he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles, prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Uh, you know, he's talking about something here. He's saying you're one building. You're one family. You're one kingdom. God is doing another work. It's based on unity. It's not about ritual. It's not about ceremony. But it's about unity. And he says, look what God's done. He's saying there's two walls here. There's the wall of Judaism and the wall of the Gentiles. There's the wall of the Old Testament, the wall of the New Testament. There's the wall of the prophets and the wall of the apostles. And he says he's brought them together because he is the cornerstone by which these walls are originate from when you're building a building especially in these days where they were built out of stone you got the perfect stone that was squared completely perfect all the angles perfect 90 degree angles and that became the measuring stone the cornerstone was set into place because everything going up and going out was measured off of that stone and so Jesus is the cornerstone. Boom, he's placed into place and everything emanates from him. The prophets and the apostles are in perfect harmony and symphony because of Christ. The Old Testament and the New Testament blend and are married together because of Christ. 
The Jewish people and the rest of the entire world are brought together because Christ is the cornerstone and we are that building being built up off of that cornerstone. And you know what I love about the fact that we're a building being built to God is because Peter says that we are living stones. We're living stones. That means unshaped stones. You see, when man builds something, he builds it out of brick. He makes a mold, and boom, a brick is made. And that's how they built the Tower of Babel. He makes a mold, and stones are cut, and that's how they made the great big pyramids. Man tries to make an image and says, this is who everybody is like. And that's why the Bible says, don't be conformed into that little mold. Because you are living stones. You're stones taken out of the field. You're those rough, uncut, unhewn stones. And he takes you and he puts you into the building where he sees fit. He's building this thing and he's putting you in. And the the prophets talked about the Messiah being the plumb line as well. You know, the plumb line is a rope that they hung off the edge and it was weighted so gravity caused it to be perfectly... um, you know, uh, perpendicular, up and down, and and they could look down the side of that wall, and and so they they take a stone, they take the Esther stone, and God says, I'm going to put Esther over here. Boom, and they put Esther over there. And then they back up, Jesus backs up, and he looks at the plumb line, and he says, perfect fit, but there's a little piece over here kind of sticking out. I'm going to take my hammer and chisel, I'm going to just kind of work on that. Just, Just put her, I'm not changing who she is, I'm just taking off this rough edge, and I'm going to put her right over there. She's being worked on now as a habitation, as being part of, of, of God. Of God. Then he takes the Todd stone <laughs> and he puts it over there and on a wall and he looks down a plumb line and he says, wow, look at that. That fits perfect. I wonder if Todd realizes how special he is and how awesome he is. That fits perfect. <laughs> You get the idea of what's happening. We look at the stone walls in New England and we say, hey, they're pretty awesome because they're not a brick wall. They have individuality. They have a uniqueness. And what he is saying here is that even though God is building you into his building, you do not lose who you are. Because God never wanted automatums. God never wanted formed bricks. He wants the individualistic of who you are. The individualism of who you are. The the uniqueness of who He created you with your personality. And He doesn't want to change that. You're not going to go to heaven and just be like you know a robot. He's not going to give you a frontal lobotomy when you get there. He wants you to be you with all of your quirkiness, with all of your person. I mean, he's going to let Ray be Ray in heaven. I mean, well, part of Ray will be Ray in heaven, you know, because he's going to put that plumb line up there and he's going to say, "Forget the chisel." Does anybody know where the dynamite is? I mean, you know, he's going to he's going to. He's going to work on these things. And so it's so exciting that God keeps our individualism and our personalities and our identities. You know, I always say this at funerals because it was said once years ago to R.A. Torrey, who was an evangelist, when somebody asked them, do you think we will recognize one another in heaven? And they were walking past a blacksmith shop and the blacksmith had a piece of metal in the fire and he was heating it up. And R.A. Torrey said, you see that piece of metal in the, in the blacksmith's fire? You see how it's glowing with the heat and how it's shining with the flames of that fire? And yet it's the same piece of metal. He says, I believe in heaven. We will shine with the love of God and we will glow with the presence of God, but we will still be the same people that we were, only perfected and part of God's temple. So what an incredible thing that he's doing here. And then the last couple verses, verses 21 and 22, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. God doesn't dwell in the tabernacle. God doesn't dwell in Solomon's temple anymore. God doesn't dwell in Jerusalem anymore. Jesus said you don't have to go here or there to worship the Father. You worship the Father in spirit and truth because God can't be contained by the earth. God can't be contained by his creation 
but he's created us and he's building us together and we are the habitation of the Lord. He is pleased to live in us and dwell in us and we make his temple. You see, we don't come to New Life Church. We are New Life Church. For all that is good and for all that is bad, we are this expression of this local church. And he says that he's making us into this habitation of the Lord. And I just want to close with this scripture. It's so powerful. 1 Kings chapter 6 and 7. This is when they were building Solomon's temple. And it says, The house, while it was being built, was built of stone prepared at the quarry. And there was neither hammer nor axe nor any iron tool heard in the house while it was being built. What a great what a great scripture this is because basically what Paul is talking about here drawing from all of these Jewish concepts and histories is he's saying we're being built here for what we will be there. The world doesn't understand what's going on. The world doesn't understand that the Holy Spirit's doing something. And we may cry here as God works in our lives. We may not understand a lot of things, like why loved ones die or why certain things happen in our lives. And and here in the quarry, we struggle and we have our pains and we have our hurts and we will suffer. But God's plumb line is working in your life. And he's shaping you here for what's going to be there because there's not going to be any more building over there. The Bible says when we get there, he'll wipe away all our tears and there's no more sorrow. We just sang that song, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain. We will be what he has wanted us to be from day one. We will be the finished product. We will be the real deal. We will be completed. And we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And it's so easy in the quarry, because that's what this life is. It's the quarry where God's walking around. And he says, hey, look at Steve. Man, I, I want to make him a stone, and I'm going to take him out of the ground of this world. I'm going to take him. But while he's in this quarry, I'm going to shape his life. I'm going to work in his life. And man, when he gets there, he's going to see right where he fits in. And what a glory that will be. What a blessing that will be. The problem comes is that sometimes we don't like the process of the shaping of God in our lives. And we want to run away We want to get a victim mentality and say, it ain't fair, or this shouldn't be happening to me, rather than allowing the purposes of God to be fulfilled in our lives. And so I want to ask you a question this morning. What is it that God is doing in your heart? Whenever you encounter something that you don't like, this, I don't like this, Uh, 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 I I don't appreciate this, I don't understand this, I don't think this is fair, I don't know why I should go through this, we can either say, God, what are you doing in me? Or we can say, I don't want that. I don't want that. And then maybe God's gonna take that stone that he intended to go here, But because you're not allowing the process of God to take place, he's going to say, gee, I'm going to have to move that stone over here. God, what are you doing in my heart? What are you doing? I don't like this place I'm in. But rather than sit there and look at the negative and complain, what is it that you're trying to do in my life, Lord? I want you to go ahead and put the plumb line on me. I want you to go ahead and take the chisel and and the hammer, and I want you to go ahead and chip these things out. I want a humility. I want to submit to you and say, God, you're the refiner's fire. Go ahead and smelt the dross out of my life. Go ahead and chip the rough edges out of my life. And so for those of you that are followers of Jesus Christ today, I want you to leave today taking that away, that question What is it, God, you are doing in me? It's so easy to look at someone else. I think of of Peter and John when Jesus was resurrected and and, and he's talking to Peter and he says, Peter, when you get older, somebody's going to take you where you don't want to go, meaning that he was going to be crucified. And Peter looked at John and said, what about him? 
If i got to go through this, what about him? And, and Jesus said, what's that to you? You follow me. I've got you over here on my bench, and I'm ch- doing some chipping. Don't look at what's going on in other people. That's none of your business. I'm the carpenter. I'm the stonemason. I'm the one that's building. Don't worry about it. I'm doing something in you, and all you have to do is say, God, I don't, I don't understand it. What are you doing in me? And you know what? I, I believe with all of my heart that when you honestly humble yourself before God and say, God, what is it that you're doing in me? What is it that you're wanting to do in me? That that's a prayer that he'll answer. He'll, maybe he's just saying, I want you to learn humility. Maybe he's saying, I want you to die to self. Maybe he'll say, I'm doing something that you couldn't even imagine in your wildest dreams. But he'll answer that. Lord, what are you doing in me? And lastly, I want to ask you a question this morning is, are you part of the building or are you just watching the construction? Because you become part of the building by giving your life and your heart to Jesus Christ. Through his blood, through his cross, he's doing this. He's finding stones and he's saying, I want to make you part of what I'm doing for eternity. I'd like you to just close your eyes right now. Everybody just close your eyes this morning. Bow your heads before God. I want to ask you that question today. Are you part of his building Or are you just on the outside watching the construction? God doesn't want you to watch the construction. He wants you to be part of the building. He wants you to be part of the construction. And the first step of that is to say, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. I give you control of my life. And I recognize that I was created by you for purposes that I will never imagine until I am submitted to you. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I've never done this before, but I really am feeling as God is telling me to give my heart, to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to ask him into my heart today. I want to know that when I die, I will go to heaven and I will be part of what he has constructed for eternity. If that's you today, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Right now, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If that's you, would you just raise your hand where I can see it this morning? Just don't be ashamed. Just put your hand right up high where I can see it. And you say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to give my heart to Jesus Christ. Is there one this morning? You raise your hand. Pastor, I want to ask Jesus Christ to come into my life and to be my Lord and to be my God. Is there one this morning? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand together in closing. As we are here today saying that we are followers of Jesus Christ, again, let me leave you with that question. God, what is it you are doing in me? What is it that you want to do in me? Father, I thank you for Jesus Christ. I thank you that in this incredible book called Ephesians, we see all these wonderful things that it's not by religious works, it's by faith. And through that faith, you've caused a new thing to come up in the earth, and that's the church. And right now, the church is at its largest zenith hour as ever before. The church is going and blowing around the world today. Thousands and thousands of people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And this thing is being established and built. And we are so thankful, oh God, to be just a small part of what you are doing. That the descendants of Abraham will be as the stars of the sky and as the sands of the seashore. Lord, you're not doing a small little thing where there's some people who are so holy it feels like it's just us four and no more. You are doing a grand thing, a massive thing. And there will be millions and myriads of myriads of believers in your kingdom and we are so thankful to be a part of that and we would just simply say lord what is it you want to do in our hearts what is it you want to shape in us that we might be built into this building of your presence through the spirit and we thank you for all of these things oh god have your way in our hearts and in our lives in jesus name and everyone said amen and amen